know Jacques is controlling the thing? Yep. Okay, good. Got you on mute. <laughs> you want this mic Oh, I am Jacques? on. Jacques, you want this mic moved? Or yes. Just, no, it's all right. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's a privilege for me to uh, share about God's blood covenant and, and actually about all blood covenants. I, I, I didn't understand any of this. I, I was born into a Christian family, raised in the church, never heard of blood covenant. You know, took Holy Communion, did not know that that was my covenant meal. You know, I, and I think a lot of us it was the same, okay. Um, I wanted to read from Leviticus 17, just verses 10 and 11. And here it says, and whatever man of the house of Israel or of the strangers who, who sword live among us, <laughs> Who eats any blood, I will set my face against that person. You know, not good when God sets his face against you, right? Who eats blood and, and will cut him off from among his people. So if they ate the blood, they would be cut off. Of course, they would die, right? For, because, verse 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. Your life force is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the souls. And you know, under the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, the blood of the animals would cover the sin, but it didn't pay for it. Okay, it had to be another animal had to die shortly in the future to cover that sin. And the Hebrew word for covenant means something which is eaten, okay, it's from a root um, that has a sense of cutting. Of course, with that comes the blood, right? It's a compact, it's a contract, an agreement, okay, usually made by walking between two pieces of flesh. And we aren't talking steaks here, we're talking animals cut right down the center, right down the backbone, and, you know, being laid out, mirror image. And often when a, a covenant was cut, there, there was at least one of these animals, usually more, and, and they were, you know, uh, killed that way, and, and, and they had like a walkway of blood when people were making a blood covenant with one another. And we'll be looking at uh, the Old Covenant. Now that word testament is covenant. Isn't that wonderful? This, this is my covenant book. My Old Covenant, the, the Hebrew or the Jewish covenant, okay? And the New Covenant, that's the Christian covenant. That one belongs to you and I, okay? Uh, a covenant is more than a contract. It's an, an unbreakable agreement. And, you know, there are many, many blessings in a covenant, but generally, if you break a blood covenant, it's the death penalty. You know, I've heard of, of Aborigines even today tracking and overtaking people that have broken their covenant, and, and they don't live to talk about it, <laughs> you know. And they kill even family members if they have broken the covenant, the covenant. Okay, it's a, it's a sacred union and everything that belongs to the one in, in, in the covenant belongs to the other that they cut covenant with if it is needed. Now, when you stop and think of our Christian covenant, we have a covenant, a blood covenant, an agreement, a contract with God Almighty cut through the blood of Jesus Christ. And everything God has belongs to us if we need it, if we need it. And, but everything you have belongs to God if he needs it. Who's got the best 
deal, right? <laughs> we have, <laughs> you know. And, uh, okay, well, cutting a covenant, there, there's always a parlay. This is, a, you know, they discuss the terms of the, of the blood covenant. And, you know, the families, they spend time together to determine if they for sure they want to. And, and, and uh, you know, generally it would, a covenant would be cut because this tribe has something that, that this tribe needs, and this tribe has something that is benef of benefit to them, and they would cut covenant. And, you know, in every nationality, there's blood covenant. You go back through, through that in, you know, every, every country. Well, it started with the Lord. I mean... <laughs> You know, and, and North America, it just sounds so strange. What are you talking about, a blood covenant? Now, you go to Africa or you go to Europe, they, it, they understand blood covenant far better than what we do. You know, we stop and think, oh, yeah, well, the Indians, they would be blood brothers. They'd cut their wrist and, and, and mingle the blood, right? And when... A, a covenant is being cut, okay, there's always witnesses. They gather witnesses. Look at your marriage covenant. You have the, you know, maid of honor and the best man. They're witnesses to that marriage. And, you know, if, if it's a Christian marriage, God is witness to that marriage covenant, okay? So, and he takes it seriously. Often there's an exchange of gifts, you know. They'll uh, exchange things. Uh, David and Jonathan, Okay, you, you exchange your, your, your belt. Well, your belt held, had your weapons and, and your sword and what else did they have? Not slingshots, but you know, it was a, a really important item that they would exchange that and all that one had belonged to the other. And Okay, there's always a sharing of a meal, a covenant meal. And, and again, under the new covenant, we have Holy Communion. What did Jesus say? Do this in remembrance of me. This is my covenant, or this is my blood of the new covenant. Do this in remembrance of me. And, you know, the, the grape juice or the wine represents the blood of Jesus. And the bread represents his body broken for us, that, that ours need not be broken. And then there, there's the um, actual sharing of blood. And, and actually, uh, it's become distorted blood covenanting over the years. Like some tribes actually drink the blood, you know. And, uh, but it's normally, most of them don't. It's, it's wine representing the blood. But there is a, a, a shedding of blood that, is, that happens, okay, whether they cut the wrist or the hand and, and mingle that, that and drip that blood. Okay, and symbolically we drink the blood of Christ, but really it's, it's grape juice, but it, it represents the blood of the Lord. Okay, there's the pronouncing of blessings. If you keep the covenant, then you, you bless them. Well, if, if, if you remain faithful to our covenant, then I will do this and I will do that and, and you know, all the blessings of the covenant. But there's curses that go with the covenant too. If you break the covenant, if you break the covenant, okay, and normally it's, it's, it's the death penalty. Also, there's what's known as a memorial. It's a sign of... of the fact that you've been in a blood covenant, okay? Well, the Hebrew sign, the, the Jewish one, would be uh, circumcision, okay? Uh, and, but then, again, the Christian, Holy Communion. It's a sign. It's a memorial, something that we do uh, in remembrance of the covenant. And there are many, many, many references to blood covenant, covenanting in scripture, you know, and again, it started with the Lord. It started with the Lord. The Hebrews had a blood covenant ritual that was similar to other nations, but 
you know, all nation, uh, blood covenanting goes back through all nations. Okay, uh, blood covenant was not unique only to the Hebrews. And often uh, the exchange of co coats or robes or belts, and you know, David and Jonathan had a covenant of salt. That means they did not sacrifice an animal, but they, they you know, made an agreement with one another that, uh, you know, if someone came up against David, well, then Jonathan would stand for David and, and vice versa. And after Saul and Jonathan and all that, all their descendants except one son of Jonathan, and David found that man, and, and he, you know, blessed him abundantly. And, and, you know, he attempted to take over the kingdom from David. And David, now mind you, he, he did make him stay in a particular city, <laughs> but uh, he didn't kill him, all right, which is the normal thing when someone tries to uh, take you out of power. Okay, and again, they, they, when they cut covenant, they split animals down the backbone and, and lay them like that, you know. And as, as the, the people cutting the covenant, they walk down, it's called a walkway of blood. Well, you can imagine if you've got three cows or something that have been slaughtered and you walk down there and, and, and it, whoever you're cutting covenant with comes the other way. And in the center, you stop and, and, and you, you pronounce the blessings of the covenant and the things that you promise each other. And, and then you continue to the end and you come back. And, and what you're doing is like an eight, you know. The number eight never ends, does it? It's, it's never ending. This covenant is going to be never ending. And so you go down and you come back this way. And, and as you come to the center, then, then you discuss the, the blessings of the covenant and, and things. It's great. And they, they would also, they, they would cut their palms and join their hands and, and the blood intermingles. It's not like a, a total transfusion or anything, but a, an intermingling of the blood. And it's symbolic of them putting off their old nature or who they used to be. You know, there's, even when Abraham and, and God cut covenant in, in Genesis 15, we'll be looking at that shortly. There was a name change. That was when God changed Abram's name to Abraham, okay, exalted father, or fa father of a multitude. The guy was 99 already with no children, right? So, but anyway, um, we, we know he did have children afterwards. But, uh, but God got his name changed too, okay? He, wa he wasn't just Yahweh anymore. He was Yahweh, the God of Abraham. He was the God of Abraham. So, uh, you know, the name change often went with it. Okay, there's a scar left. And again, that's kind of a memorial of the blood covenant. It's a sign that it had happened and, and, and that it came to pass. And the memorial meal, okay, usually the the people cutting covenant, they would feed one another bread and, and give them a drink of wine and, you know, and, and it's as it, symbolically the bread represents their body, okay? And again, the wine represents their blood. And in a way, then I partake of that bread and wine that you have given me and, and it represents your, your body and blood. It's, it's within me and I'm within you. We are one. We are one in purpose, okay? And, you know, if, if they're attacked or, or anything happens, well, then they, they aren't alone because they've got their covenant brothers are there to help them. When Lot was in Sodom, and uh, I think it was five kings 
and they, they took over Sodom and Gomorrah and another city. But anyway, when Abraham heard that Lot had been taken captive and his family, he went after them. And he went after them with 300, and I, I forget the number, whether it's 360 armed slaves, servants of his. They had been trained for battle. These guys were warriors. <laughs> I mean, you know, he had quite a, quite a few cattle and things, I guess, Abraham. But he didn't go alone to that battle against the kings. His covenant brothers went with him. And, it, you know, there's so many covenants that are, that are mentioned, but they attacked Abraham's family. And, and he went, and his covenant brothers stood with him and went as well. Okay, I just wanted to turn to uh, Genesis 15. And here, God is cutting covenant with Abraham. God has said, you know, you'll, you'll be a father of many nations. I'm going to give you this land, and, and uh, you know, your descendants will have it. And, okay, verse 8. And Abram says, Lord God, how shall I know? How will I know that I will inherit it? He's 99. And God's saying, oh yeah, well, the day will come when I give this land to your, your descendants, you know. And he said, how will I know? So God proves it to him by cutting a covenant. So God said to, to Abram, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then Abram brought all these things to, to God and cut them in two down the middle, okay? And, and like I said, down the backbone, it, w the, it was really disgusting, but it was cut, you know, and the animals were laid like that, at, like a mirror image, and there's room to walk in between them. Verse 10, then he brought all these to God and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. So they didn't walk between them right away. Okay, Abram got to guard these. And can you imagine how, I don't know, there's three or four animals there cut and the blood and everything and and the birds are coming they want lunch and you know and when the vultures came down on the carcasses Abram drew the, drove them away now when the sun was going down a deep sleep fell upon Abram it's kind of like a trance that he went into and behold horror and great darkness fell upon him then God said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and, will, and they will serve them, and they will afflict them 400 years. Well, we know they were there in, in Egypt, right? Verse 14, And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. And Abraham I think he was about 160 when he died. Could be wrong, maybe it was 158. But uh, he had another wife after Sarah and, and six more sons. And so, you know, he ended up having eight sons that he knew and all, so many descendants. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here for the iniquity because the iniquity, okay, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So God didn't want to kick them out until they had, their sin had mounted to the point where they needed to be judged. And at verse 17, and it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark 
that behold, there was a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. Can you imagine Abram watching this? And it was like two divine presences. I don't know which ones they were. I stagger a guess, but you know. And that went down, up and down that walkway of blood as, as he's cutting covenant with Abram. And then just in case we didn't understand what's going on, verse 18 says, on the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. You know, like, I didn't understand what it was. The first time I, I read this, it made absolutely no sense. But he's cutting covenant. And Abram knows that he knows that God will fulfill his, his word. He will have sons and he will. His descendants will have the land. Now, and you don't see a covenant meal right here, but uh, later. Now, there are, um, we're going to turn to those scriptures shortly. Concerning the origin of, of blood covenant, you know, uh, Livingstone, uh, you know, you've heard of him, right, in Africa. And he was there so long that uh, Henry Stanley went after him to see if he, you know, try and find Livingstone. <laughs> He'd been there so many years. But Livingston said that the African tribes involved in blood covenants resembled in dress and utensils those things that they found in the pyramids of, of Egypt. And when Henry Stanley went to Africa looking for Livingston, he came into contact with a, a powerful equatorial tribe. And I, I think it was his guide that told Stanley, you know, you really need to cut covenant with them. And uh, I think Stanley was quite ill at the time, and the only thing he could really digest was this goat's milk, this goat that he had at the time. But it, that was given to the, you know, the, the, the tribal uh, that he was cutting covenant with because he gave that to them and then they gave him a stick well you know it was like a walking stick he thought he'd gotten ripped off but he came to find out as he as he traveled through Africa anybody look at that stick they knew that there's lots of cuts in it there's lots of covenants that that he belongs to okay and these tribes back him up so <laughs> He did get the best of the deal, although he thought he, he hadn't at the time. And as Stanley is traveling through Africa looking for Livingston, he cut covenant 50 times, 50 times. How can you cut covenant 50 times? You wouldn't have an arm left, right? But you know, it can be done by proxy, right? Aren't you glad Jesus stood in for us? And, but, you know, those scars and that, that uh, pole, walking stick, I guess you would call it. So he, he often cut covenant, but it was really the men that he had with him that, that were the ones that uh, were, were getting, you know, dripping the blood into the cup and all that kind of thing. Now, you know, because man was willingly proceeded to sacrifice his son for Yahweh, then Yahweh could legally sacrifice his son for mankind. We read in Genesis 22. Actually, I'm going to turn there. I should watch the time a little bit. Genesis 22. And here, God has said to Abram, Sacrifice your son, your only son, as a burnt offering. Well, a burnt offering, when, when you look at the offerings in the Old Testament, everything was destroyed. They didn't keep the skin of the animal. They didn't eat any of the food or, or any of the meats. And everything was destroyed. And Abram knew this. 
And I used to get so upset at this chapter. I think, oh, Lord, how could you ask him to kill his baby, his little boy? Gosh. 22.2. And God said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac. Well, we know he had two sons at that time. But Isaac was the only son of the promise, of the covenant, okay? He was the son of the covenant. Whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Now, actually, Isaac isn't a small child. He's actually a young man. He, he'd be 20, 22 years old at this time. That would make Abraham 120 or 122 years. Who's in, in charge here? Who is stronger? What is, you know, but verse 3. So Abraham arose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. And he split the, the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. He's immediately obedient to do what the Lord has told him to do. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. Poor Abraham, what was he thinking all the way there? Three days and three nights knowing that you're going to, you know, kill your son and burn him so there's nothing left, right? And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad, you know, the young man, and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. We will come back to you. Okay, so you can see the faith of Abraham. He knew Isaac was the son of, pro of the promise. He was the son that, that was to inherit the covenant. The blood covenant belonged to Isaac. We will come back to you. Verse 6. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it on Isaac, his son. So many um, similarities here between the crucifixion of Jesus and what Isaac went through here. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son and he took the fire in his hand and a knife and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, my father. And he said, here I am my son. And he said, look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. And the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Well, Isaac is being 100% obedient to his father. I mean, I don't know how big a wood pile that would be to, you know, a grown man that you would, would put on the top of that and, and burn. But... Isaac would have had to climb up there himself and, and, you know, I mean, he was obedient, obedient to do what the Lord told him, and Isaac was obedient to do what his father told him. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took a knife to slay his son, but the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, an angel there is, is capitalized in the King James, which means it's a person of the Godhead. Called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And at verse 13, a ram caught in a thicket by it. And they, so they, Abraham went, got the ram, and offered it for the burnt offering. Verse 18, in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. That seed 
there is singular, uh, representing Jesus, right? Okay, so the cutting of the Abrahamic covenant uh, was in uh, Genesis 15. And it was originally established with Abraham, but then it was renewed with his descendants. And at the coming of Christ, okay, it, it was... I became the new covenant, actually grew out of the old covenant. Okay, let's look at the different parts of the, the cutting of the covenant. Okay, Genesis 17, and there we'll see uh, the parley or, or the discussion. And not every part of uh, every step in a blood covenant is given in, in a lot of detail in scripture, but we, we know it's there. Genesis 17, 1 to 8. And this is Al Shaddai, Almighty God. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you, and will multiply you exceedingly. And again, not, he's 99 years old and has no children yet, right? Then Abram fell on his face. This isn't strange. This is a position of worship. Did you know in Scripture the only meaning for the word worship is to bow down to, to do obeisance to? It means to bow down, to worship. It, you know, when we sing, we call it worship, it's praise. <laughs> but anyway, three, then Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. And I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your descendants after you. In their generations, for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And then it, it goes on to say, uh, verse 10, this is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant or a memorial of the covenant between me and you. And, uh, you know, the Jewish people still do this today when their son is eight years old. He is circumcised. Eight days old, sorry. Eight days. I said years, didn't I? <laughs> eight days old, yeah. <laughs> they, they might have a complaint there. But anyway, it's a sign. It's a memorial of the covenant. Okay, witnesses, uh, well, Genesis 22, the, the Lord was there. And the two divine beings there in Genesis 15 when, when uh, Abraham and God were cutting covenant. Okay, the smoking oven and the burning torch. How would you describe the presence of the Lord, right? I, I think Abraham did a pretty good job there. Exchange of gifts. Uh, Genesis 17. Yeah, well, it, it more it's, a, it's a, a name change, isn't it, here? Because he became the God of Abraham, and Abram became Abraham here. The shedding of blood again in Genesis 15, the animals and the birds, they died. The, the blood was a mess. <laughs> and then, of course, the circumcision is a shedding of blood as well uh, when the baby is circumcised. 
The memorial, again, is, is circumcision of, of the babies, uh, baby boys at age eight days. And the Passover meal is a remembrance of the covenant that they had. And it was added afterwards um, when they, right before they left Egypt, and the destroyer passed over the Hebrews, right? Over their homes, and yet the firstborn of the, the people and the animals of Egypt all died that night. Okay, blessings and curses. We'll look at Genesis 12. And you know, uh, Deuteronomy 28, there it has uh, the blessings of the covenant and the curses of the covenant. You know, should you uh, break it, what would happen? And there's 14, first 14 verses in Deuteronomy 28 are blessings. They're on the blessings of the covenant for keeping the covenant. The curses for breaking the covenant, I think it's 56, maybe 57 verses of curses, okay? So it's not good to break the covenant. <laughs> Okay, Genesis 12. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country, from your, kind, from your kindred and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth sh shall be blessed. Well, how would in Abram, Abraham, he became Abraham after this, but uh, again, it was through his descendant, okay, through, through Jesus. But he did not, God didn't ex continue, he didn't show him the land or anything until after Abram was obedient to the Lord. Abram immediately packed up and, and went to the promised land, but he was supposed to leave his family and go with his wife and his servants and his cattle. And, but he took his father with him. He took his nephew Lot and his family. And, and uh, so it was... I'm not sure, it doesn't come out clearly in scripture how many years, but I'll bet you it was 20 years or so before in the promised land, God said, Abram, walk with me. And, and you know, every, every place you walk and set your foot, this is the land I have promised you. But he waited until after Terah died, Abram's father, and until Lot left him. And then he said, okay, now Abram, Abraham. Because Abraham was, you know, had taken them along. Okay, I... It's 68 verses of curses in, in uh, Deuteronomy 28. I'm just checking to see what I've missed here. The curses were sworn for the old covenant on Mount Ebal by Moses, the priests, and the Levites. And, but the blessings were sworn on Mount Gerizim by Moses, the priests, and the Levites. Okay, Genesis 13 and... and uh, Verse 12, now this is on Lot. Abraham's nephew. And he had moved, he, he left Abraham because the, the land wasn't big enough to, for their, all their cattle. And, and I have no idea how many cattle and things that, that Abraham would have had, but I mean, he had 315 
servants that, that had been trained for war. So he had a lot of servants. They must have had something to do. You know, he must have had a lot of cattle or something. Okay, 13, and it's verse 12. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. And the Lord said to Abram after Lot had separated from him, Lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, westward. For all the land which you see I give to you and to your descendants forever. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. But again, he waited until Lot had left him. I think it's Exodus 24. If I'm not wrong. And here, God is renewing his covenant with the descendants of Abraham. I'm in Genesis. I'm in the wrong book. Twenty-four, verse 1. Now he said, God said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and, and Abihu. Well, Aaron was the high priest. He was Moses' brother. And then Nadab and Abihu were Aaron's sons, and they were priests, okay? And 70 of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. So come on up, but stay back some. Okay, and Moses alone shall come near the Lord. Okay, verse 5. Then he, Moses, sent young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. Okay, so, so there's a lot of blood flowing and things. And Moses took half the blood and put it in basins, and half the blood Moses sprinkled on the altar. Then Moses took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. Now, uh, the Ten Commandments basically was, okay, but this is the blood covenant with Yahweh being renewed with the descendants of Abraham. Verse 8, And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. Then Moses went up also, okay, again, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone, and it was like the very heavens in its clarity. There's also a, a vision of, the, of God on his throne in Isaiah 6, 1. Verse 11, but on the nobles of the children of Israel, God did not lay his hand. So they saw God, and they ate and drank. Well, there's your covenant meal, right? And it's renewed. Then the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and be here. But it's the renewal of the Abrahamic covenant with, with the descendants. I think my time is right. Yeah, wow. I'm, I'm amazed. I'm, I'm finished early. <laughs> we'll we'll look at uh, we'll begin looking at the marriage covenant. <laughs> okay, 
the parlay for, for the marriage covenant, did you realize that when you cut covenant, I mean, when you got married, you were cutting covenant with your spouse and that God was your witness? He was one of your witnesses. Let's look at Ephesians 5, 22 to 24. And we'll do the new covenant next week. <laughs> okay, the parley, the exchange of vows, of course, with the marriage covenant as well. Ephesians 5, 22 to 28. Wives, submit to your, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, or, or you know, reverence. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. And you know, it, this doesn't mean to be a doormat for your husband, but you're to respect his opinion and, you know, as long as he's not way off base, <laughs> you can go along with him, right? <laughs> now, 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 now. <laughs> and husbands are to love their wives. Well, and just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, he died for the church. He died for you and I. And so husbands are to cherish their wives as well, you know. So, And that's a good idea. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> okay, witnesses. Matthew 18, 19, and 20. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Okay. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. You know, husband and wife, when you pray, the Lord is there with you. That, that's power. That's power. Malachi 2.14, last book in the Old Testament, right before Matthew. And this is the Lord speaking. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth with whom you have dealt treacherously, yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. God was not happy when they got rid of their 40-year-old wife and got a couple of 20-year-olds. Not good. And he, you know, he let them have it. But the Lord is there when you get married. When if it's a Christian wedding, he's there, and he's watching, and he's listening to your promise, to your vows, to your spouse, and God and the members of the wedding party as well, they are witnesses, witnesses to that covenant.
the exchange of gifts, while with the, with the marriage covenant, it, uh, the rings, okay? And this precious metal is a token of your faith and love. And, and a ring is a circle. Again, it's never ending. It, it's, it doesn't end, okay? And we are, we are to respect one another. The sharing of the meal, of course, would be the wedding reception. Shedding of blood, uh, the consummation of the marriage and the marriage bed. And memorial, again, wedding rings, wedding anniversary. Blessings and curses. We who are in Christ Jesus are redeemed from the curses, which is kind of nice. It's, I like it. <laughs> you know, the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant belong also to the Christian. So again, in, in uh, Deuteronomy 1 to 13, verse 14 actually doesn't have any blessings in it. It just says that these were the blessings of the covenant you know, and refers back to it. And a, Christ, a Christian receives then only the blessings. These covenants all are sealed by the shedding of blood. The new covenant, the old covenant, the marriage covenant. Okay, so they're life-giving covenants. There's a laying down of your lives for every member of the, whom, whom you are in covenant with. Okay, husband and wife, the husband lays down his life for the wife and the wife lays down her life for the, for the husband. Okay, you keep your spouse first place in your life and really that's where your spouse needs to be. Yes, you have children, but your, your spouse actually comes first. Not that you let the kid go without, but... <laughs> Okay, and, and again, I'll read uh, Leviticus 17, 10 and 11. We actually looked there way back when. And whatever man of the house of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn among you, who eats any blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood and will cut him off from among his people. God is not pleased. For, verse 11, because for the life of the flesh is in the blood. Okay. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. It's the blood, the life and the blood that covered the sins uh, in the old covenant. It's the life and the blood of Jesus that paid for our sins in the new covenant. I mean, our covenant, our contract is so much better than the Jewish one. And I never knew that testament meant covenant. Goodness, contract. I didn't know that. But, uh, and the new covenant, the new testament grew out of the old. Okay, these are life-giving covenants. And there's a laying down of your lives for every member of a covenant. As Christ died for us to be able to come into covenant relationship with our Heavenly Father, so we likewise must die to ourselves. And I was going to say the song, but actually the scripture is, No longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. And, you know, it's, it's true. You are one with Christ, and he is one with us. And that's actually Galatians 2.20, but I already sang it, right? So we don't have to turn there. <laughs> In the marriage covenant, each spouse needs to lay down their lives for the other, esteeming their 
their spouse's needs before their own needs. You don't often see that today. I, I, I'm, I'm surprised how, how selfish some people can be. And, you know, but you need to, if you put your spouse first and make, make them a priority in your life, you won't have any problems or not too many. Okay, and walking in agape love, it's, it's, it's a, a sacrificial love one to another, one to another. Now, Ezekiel 23. I have no idea what that says, but it's here. It must be important. Ezekiel 23. Thirty-seven to thirty-nine. Whoa, God isn't happy with the Israelites here. They weren't walking in agape love with, with the Lord, and he'd had it with them too. He wasn't about to walk in agape. Thirty-six, the Lord also said to me, Son of man, will you judge O Ohola and Oholaba, then declare to them their abominations. For they, and, and he's talking about the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, right? For they have committed adultery and blood is on their hands. They committed adultery with their idols. God really doesn't like that. And even sacrificed their sons whom they bore to me passing them through the fire to de devour them. God was very upset that they caused the death of their children and sacrificed their children to these, these false gods. Moreover, they have done this to me. They have defiled my sanctuary on the same day and profaned my Sabbaths. For after they had slain their children for their idols on the same day, they came into my sanctuary to profane it. And indeed, thus they have done in the midst of my house. You know, it was a continuous circle with the Israelites and, and the Lord. It was just, they would serve God. Things would be so nicey-nice and everything was going well. And then they would get into idol worship and God would take his hand of blessing off the people. And then they would turn back, they would cry out to the Lord, save us, save us. And he would save them. He would bless them. He'd send them a judge or a deliverer and he'd rescue his people. And they would be faithful to Yahweh for a time and then they'd get back into the idol worship, you know, and the Lord would lift his hand of blessing off them. It was a, a vicious circle, okay? And, uh, and I'm not sure why it's in here with the marriage covenant, but... <laughs> and I'm going to go on with the new covenant next week, okay? And that's our covenant. Wow. So much better, so much, it's awesome, it's awesome. And God did it for us, he did it for us. You know, in a covenant, everything, the, the one you're cut in covenant with belongs to you if you need it. And the opposite is true, everything you have belongs to them if they need it. We've got the best part of this, believe me. Believe me, everything God has, if I need it, okay, not a greed thing, but if I need it, it's mine. But God has a right to everything you have, if he needs it. <laughs> 